Coming to you live from the fabulous Mediaplex in downtown Windsor, this is a St. Clair College journalism presentation. Hi, I'm Rob Benyon and you're watching Mediaplex News Now. A local group recently hosted a concert and pasta dinner to promote the benefits of music therapy. Rick Dawes has the story. It's with the help of the community that members of a local charity can participate in music therapy. The staff and clients of Harmony in Action hosted a concert and pasta dinner to raise money for the program. Doors opened at 5. The attendees of the event were comprised mostly of family, friends and support workers of Harmony in Action clients, along with members of the public. After a meal of pasta, salad and desserts, clients of Harmony in Action sang songs they had been practicing for this event. Tickets for the night were $8 in advance, $10 at the door, and over 120 were sold. Executive Director Elizabeth Esposito said music therapy helps build clients' self-esteem, even in those clients who never talk in public before. Now they sing. We had a music room developed, and our participants loved to sing. So we did some research, and we were able to uh, find Candace, who is a certified music therapist, and we invited her to come on board with us. The University of Windsor offers a music therapy program and states on their website, Music therapy is an established healthcare profession that uses music to address physical, emotional, cognitive, social, and spiritual needs of individuals of all ages. Harmony's music therapist is Candace Gardner, and she spends 8 to 10 hours a week with the clients. And um, creating different activities to elicit certain um, behaviors from a particular uh, participant or a client. And um, we work on non-musical goals such as like communication, socialization, and things like that. Harmony holds fundraisers like this to keep programs such as music therapy accessible to clients. For Mediaplex News Now, I'm Rick Dawes. Construction is still on schedule for the opening of Highway 3. Marissa DeBorderly reports. Beginning this week, traffic along Highway 3 will be shifting to a new 3-kilometer section of the Wright Honorable Herb Gray Parkway between Howard Avenue and Huron Church Line. Cindy Prince, Communications Manager for the Parkway Infrastructure Construction, outlined the shift plan during a news conference March 25th. We'll need to uh, set up a closure of the existing lanes of Highway 3, so not only do we have to get the traffic on the new part of the road, but we have to stop it from traveling uh, on the old part. This section of the parkway was due to be completed in February, but Michael Hatchell, Project Director for PIC, says the construction is still on schedule. We're shooting for February with the weather and other things. We've had some impacts with that, uh, but this should, this should not impact us from the overall schedule. The current schedule still shows substantial completion as originally scheduled. The OPP will be on hand this week to assist with the transition. I'm Marissa DeBorderly reporting for Mediaplex News Now. Windsor's water is now fluoride free. As of Monday afternoon, the hydrofluorocytic acid that has been added to the system was shut off. Windsor has been supplementing the water since October of 1961. And now let's head over to weather specialist Kenton Wolf. How is it out there, Kenton? It's snowing, but it's going to get very chilly tonight with negative 7. I'll be back a little late in the show to give you our extended forecast. Back to you, Rob. Prospective students visited the Mediaplex this past Saturday. Jamie Adam was on the scene. Future and potential students had a chance to tour St. Clair this weekend. The Mediaplex campus, home to St. Clair's journalism, public relations, and media convergence programs, had an open house Saturday. Second and first year students were there to offer their first-hand experience and show guests around. There was even a live show to show potential students what the journalism program is all about. Phil Chapman says the facilities he had when taking journalism 20 years ago were not nearly as advanced as the Mediaplexes are. We had a bunch of old Apple computers, we were stuffed away in the basement, uh, we used line tape and exacto knives and uh, we didn't do our layout. When I, first, when I first attended, we didn't do layout on computers. We did it all by hand. Paul McDonald, news director for AM800 CKLW, was among one of the potential future employers at the open house, and he says the staff and facilities at the Mediaplex are some of the best. This is state-of-the-art equipment here. This is, uh, this is some of the best that you'll see in the industry. 
Comparatively speaking, what we have over at AM800, I mean, it's very much the same. The newsroom software is the same. A lot of the microphones, a lot of the edit suites all look the same. It's a newer setting here, which is great. That's what makes it so, uh, so great for students to learn. It's a great atmosphere to learn in. Veronique Mandel is head of the journalism program, and she was one of the guests on the live show. She confirms St. Clair's journalism program can't be beat. Our students are able to go out into the news world and work uh, in any kind of uh, newsroom, whether it's radio, television, print, and online. So what we offer is a dual program. Uh, we offer the traditional type of uh, journalism experience, but we also do the digital. We actually go digital first. Visitors are always welcome to come and check out the Mediaplex campus. For Mediaplex News Now, I'm Jamie Adam. The open house brought out many soon-to-be students, including Jonathan Hutton. Alice Hewitt was on hand to interview him. I'm here with Jonathan Hutton. Jonathan is a prospective student of ours. So what drew you to the open house today? Well, I know a couple of people who attend the college here, and they're always uh, praising this program and everything, so I thought I'd come over and give it a check out. So we have a number of programs in the building. Is there one that interests you particularly? Uh, absolutely. The journalism program here and uh, possibly the media convergence. So you'll be choosing St. Clair for your education? Definitely. After what I've seen here today, this program is phenomenal. The teachers here know exactly what they're doing. Everything's hands-on. I've compared this program to other programs throughout uh, North America, actually, and nothing comes close to this. Is there an aspect of media that you're particularly interested in? Uh, actually, yes. I'd like to become a news anchor when I get older, but uh, <laughs> got to work uh, to get over there. I have a functioning smoke alarm? If not, the Wake Up Get a Working Smoke Alarm program may be just for you. What's happening in this city is unacceptable. So says Windsor's fire chief Bruce Montone. Since 2007, structural fires in Windsor with significant loss have gone up 75 percent. Fires are happening where there is structural loss in this community on average of one every other day. Additionally, 43 percent of the homes in Windsor lack a working smoke alarm, something that Chief Fire Prevention Officer Lee Tom called a huge concern. When we look at the causes of this increase. The three major causes that we're seeing is first, unattended cooking. Second, is arson and vandalism. And third, is smoking and the behaviors associated with smoking. Windsor Fire and Rescue Services has launched a new program called Wake Up, Get a Working Smoke Alarm. They plan to blitz the city, hitting every single home and offering a free fire safety inspection. I'm saying that the city of Windsor can turn this around. I'm Rob Benyon, reporting for Mediaplex News Now. Significant loss fires have been on the rise in Windsor. On this edition of 5 Minutes With, I spoke with Fire Chief Bruce Montone. Let's take a look. Hi, I'm Rob Benyon, and today we're spending 5 Minutes With Windsor Fire Chief Bruce Montone. Now, Chief Montone, I know you've only spent uh, less than two years at your current posting in Windsor. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us some of your background in firefighting and how you arrived in Windsor? Sure. Uh, actually, uh, I joined Windsor uh, about 19 months ago, roughly, and uh, I brought with me 36 years of experience in the fire service. Uh, certainly, I've uh, fulfilled every role on the suppression side, uh, from uh, a volunteer firefighter up through the ranks to an incident commander. Uh, but I've also brought with me uh, significant experience in the fire prevention division, performing public fire safety education as well as compliance inspections and fire cause and origin uh, investigations. I spent 16 of those years with the oversight body, the Office of the Fire Marshal, and just prior to joining Windsor I was the deputy fire chief in our nation's capital. Now, at a recent uh, press conference, you spoke about a rise in significant loss fires. Can you talk about what that means for Windsor? Yeah, um, that's, that loss uh, increase is significant. Uh, I'm going to tell you that it's almost double what it was three years ago. Um, but in addition to the actual dollar loss, the number of structure fires with loss has gone up significantly to the point where we're averaging a significant structure loss fire every other day here in the city. Now, uh, how concerned are you about the, the rise in significant loss fires? Well, very, very concerned. Obviously, uh, the dollar loss uh, has an impact on the entire community, not just those who have suffered the loss of the fire, but also our injury rates are up and, of course, our fire fatalities are up. And when we look at the fire fatalities specifically, three of the last four fatalities 
have uh, been in situations where there was no working smoke alarm, and that is unacceptable. So what does the fire department plan to do to kind of combat this, uh, this lack of working smoke alarms? In the well, we're going to do a number of things. First of all, we're going to double our efforts relative to educating the public on why smoke alarms are so important. I mean, they are the simplest and most inexpensive way for residents to protect themselves should a fire occur. But we also want to focus on the prevention messages to prevent that fire from happening uh, in the first place. Our three most common causes of fires in this city are first, almost 25% of our fires are unattended cooking. So we need to educate the public not to leave their cooking unattended and also what to do should a fire occur when they're cooking. Uh, secondly, deliberately set fires are an, the next largest percentage of our fires and so we need to engage uh, the citizens of this city in becoming more aware as well as we're going to double our efforts with our partners at Windsor Police and the Office of the Fire Marshal to ensure that we thoroughly investigate the cause and that we very vigorously pursue um, those uh, who are responsible uh, so that they are prosecuted. Now saying that they need to become more aware in a sense you want them to wake up? Absolutely we want them to wake up and that is in fact the name of our new public awareness campaign and it's going to be Wake Up Windsor, Get a Working Smoke Alarm and we're going to put all of our staff on the streets from the most senior officers, myself, the deputies, all of the division chiefs, to the firefighters in the stations. We're going to invite our local politicians and the service club community as well as the individual vulnerable community, uh, uh, community groups to join us on the street to eventually knock on every single door in this city to make sure that there are working smoke alarms. Now you've said you want uh, every resident in the city of Windsor to have a working smoke alarm. Is that realistic? I think it's very realistic. Communities that have undertaken similar programs to this have seen their uh, statistics greatly improve in a very, very short time period. In fact, one community saw their um, percentages of non-compliance close to the same as here in Windsor at 39% and five years later they were less than 10%. So programs like this do work. We just need to be patient and we need to uh, make sure that we double our efforts to pass that message along. It seems like uh, the biggest problem has been a sense of apathy amongst the citizens, would you agree? Absolutely. The average resident doesn't really personalize uh, the fact that a fire could occur in their home, nor do they prepare should that fire occur. So when you think about not really personalizing it, thinking, oh, it'll happen to my neighbor or to someone else, I don't really need to, to worry about it, that's really, really the first thing that we need to change in terms of public attitude. Secondly then is to take those steps necessary. Make sure your home has working smoke alarms on every level, uh, sorry, on every level of your home and immediately outside sleeping areas. You want to make sure that you plan for your escape and you need to practice that escape plan so that should a fire occur, you know what to do. I'm Rob Benyon and we've just spent five minutes with Fire Chief Bruce Montone. Award-winning poet Phil Hall gave a poetry reading at the Art Speak Gallery in Windsor. Tom Morrison was there. Two brothers start school. The teacher asks their names. Lester B. Pearson Smith, John Diefenbaker Smith. Award-winning poet Phil Hall is the current writer-in-residence at the University of Windsor. Hall participated in a public reading at the Art Speak Gallery March 14th. He read a few poems, sang a song, and had a Q and A session with Windsor Poet Laureate Marty Gervais and the audience. Hall's latest book, Kill Deer, won the Governor General's Award for Poetry in 2011. The University of Windsor graduate said that the writing style arose from getting bored with traditional line breaks. I wanted to have wit so that I could say more than something chiseled. I wanted to be able to say everything I wanted to say. Gervais, who published one of Hall's books, said he was very excited when he heard Hall had won the award. You know, it's like somebody in your neighborhood winning the lottery. And, you know, you want to call them and congratulate them. And, uh, and bug them for money. <laughs> Hall also read from his new book set to be released in May. Come on, he'd say. Come on. If you think you're man enough. Anytime you think you're man enough. 
Hall will remain as writer in residence until March 28th. For MediaFlex News Now, I'm Tom Morrison. Stress getting to you? Courtney Turnbull talks about what foods can help or hinder your stress levels on this week's Health Minute. Do you feel stressed out all the time? Full of anxiety and fear? So what are you worried about? I'm Courtney Turnbull and today I'm going to be talking to you about ways to reduce anxiety with the foods you eat. Did you know anxiety disorders are the most common of all mental health problems affecting about 1 in 10 people? According to Dr. Oz, there are foods that prevent anxiety. First, the foods you should avoid are fried foods, foods full of carbs, unrefined sugars, fizzy drinks, caffeine and alcohol. Seven foods that cure anxiety are whole grain foods like pasta and bread, seaweed, blueberries, almonds, chocolate, tuna and yogurt. Make sure to drink plenty of water also. So instead of reaching for that alcoholic beverage, try some of these healthy options. Keep calm and carry on. I'm Courtney Turnbull and this has been your Health Minute. With zombies becoming more popular every day, The Walking Dead takes a new look at the zombie genre. Maureen Mary Impala talks with Mike L on our new segment, Comics Crossover. Welcome to our new show, Comics Crossover. I'm Maureen Mary Impala. And I'm Mike L. Each week we are going to be talking about what's going on in the comic book world, followed by the read of the week. So let's get right into it. Long before the popular AMC TV show, The Walking Dead, zombies were around in folklore, literature, and films. The concept of the undead rising and wreaking havoc among the living has been reinvented by The Walking Dead's writer, Robert Kirkman. Did you know that Robert Kirkman originally wanted to call his zombie comic book Night of the Living Dead since the original 1968 movie by George Romero is in the public domain. However, Image Comics publisher Jim Valentino convinced Kirkman that he should think of an original title in case he ever wanted to create merchandise or, say, adapt into a TV show. Thus, Kirkman renamed it The Walking Dead. So, Michael, we are after all a journalism program. Is there any news in the world of comics? Uh, yes, actually this week the graphic novel Persepolis is being pulled from public school library shelves in Chicago. Persepolis tells the autobiographical story of an Iranian girl living through the Islamic Revolution. Apparently it was banned because of a single panel featuring a man being tortured, which was deemed inappropriate for seventh graders. Interestingly, the only other country in the world that has banned the comic book is Iran. Now for those looking for a good read, what would you recommend for this week? Uh, this week I would recommend Action Comics number 18, the final issue of Grant Morrison's redefining run on Superman. He returned the character to his depression era roots, even making direct references to stories originally published in 1938. Issue 18 promises to wrap up many of the subplots that began in the rebooted Action Comics number 1. Next week we'll be talking about the Comics Journal's Top 100 of the 20th Century. I'm Maureen Mariampola. And I'm Mike Kell. Tune in next week. Now let's head back out to the corner of University in Victoria where Kenton Wolf has the weather. Thanks Rob. Have you been painting your eggs yet? Obviously it's Easter this weekend, but do you know exactly how the date for it is determined? Well, it's always on the first Sunday after the first full moon after March 21st. Now let's take a look at this week's extended forecast. Tomorrow will be partly cloudy with a high of 6 and a low of negative 1. Thursday expect a high of 6 and a low of negative 1 with partial cloudiness once again. And Friday we'll see a high of 7 and a low of 1. Don't forget to check us out at themediaplex.com, tweet us at the underscore mediaplex, or like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash mediaplexcanada. That's it. That's all for your weather update, Rob. Back to you. No, I haven't started painting my eggs yet. With Run for the Cure coming up, Ozzy Viscaino spoke with Shayla Barker, Windsor Volunteer Run Director for the CIBC, in another edition of 5 Minutes With. Hi, I'm Ozzy Viscaino, and today we are spending 5 Minutes With with Shayla Barker. Shayla is a Windsor Volunteer Run Director for CIBC Run for the Cure. So Shayla, tell me, how did the Run for the Cure get started? Sure, um, Ozzy, uh, the Run for the Cure actually started um, 24 years ago um, in Toronto um, by a group of ladies that wanted to do something to um, get back to the cause and support the Canadian Breast Cancer Foundation. So it actually, we brought it to Windsor, it's been spreading across communities across Canada and came to Windsor about 15 years ago. So October 6, 2013 will be our 15th run here locally. Why did you get involved? Uh, I got involved for personal reasons. My grandmother is a 25 year plus survivor, so it's something that is near and dear to my heart. And right now one in nine women are being affected. So myself and, and those out there are gonna be likely affected. So we wanted to do something to give back uh, to the cause. 
What is your goal for the event for this year? Um, our goal is kind of twofold. Obviously, it's to fundraise to support the Canadian Breast Cancer Foundation, and as well, the foundation is um, set on to raise awareness, educate women, and to, to promote um, a future without breast cancer. Have you seen any increase in the number of people taking part this year compared to last year? Absolutely. Every year um, the event grows. Uh, we really encourage those that participate in our event to invite friends, family, and more people are touched by the cause, so they want to do something to, to give back and, and to get involved. What are you doing different this year to attract more people to support the event? Well, every year we try to think of new and creative ideas to get out into the community, um, really take advantage of any new local events that are um, happening that we can get involved, uh, because obviously those that have been involved know how wonderful of an event it is, um, and those that haven't had an opportunity to, to come out or know about the Run for the Cure, um, we want them to be able to, to be aware um, and to be able to, to come out on the day of, but ultimately just to be aware of breast cancer. What other activities other than the Run for the Cure do you have to raise awareness? Absolutely. Um, well, we have different uh, events that happen throughout the community. Here locally, we take advantage of parades, um, different um, community events um, that we can go out to. Um, we do pink ribbon campaigns. We did last year pink, Paint the Town Pink Challenge, where we challenge businesses in Windsor to pink up, uh, to you know raise awareness for the cause itself. Um, and this year, we're hoping that the Pink Bus Tour, which came out last year um, throughout um, several communities in, in the Windsor-Essex area, is gonna be coming out. So we're campaigning for that right now, actually. What future plans do you have for the event? Uh, well, every event uh, we try to come up with something creative, a different theme. Um, so we're in the planning stages right now. So I can't really tell you that secret yet, Ozzy, as to what we're going to be planning for on Run Day. Um, but in past, uh, last year we had an Olympic theme. Um, we always try to take what's going on in the world and try to make a, a really kind of cute twist and theme and something special for our survivors that come out for the event. What are some of the most poignant stories or one story that has moved you during the course of your time with the event? Well, you know, I'll see there's always, there's so much more than just even one story. Every time, every run day, um, it's an emotional day. Um, you meet people throughout um, the event, getting fundraising and different events that we have. You hear people's personal stories and they share with you, you know, about themselves, about a family member or a loved one, and kind of how it's touched them. And, you know, it brings tears and I'm gonna start tearing up now. Um, to everyone uh, when you hear those stories and then of my own personal stories as well. When is the next event and what do people need to do? Um, Ozzy, our big event is Sunday, October 6, 2013. So we encourage anyone that's looking for more information uh, to go to www.runforthecure.com. You can find out all the information regarding our event as well as links to the Canadian Breast Cancer Foundation for any details or information. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter as well too for any information. Thanks for coming. We've just spent five minutes with Shayla Barker, Windsor Volunteer Run Director for CIBC Run for the Cure. Windsor gymnasts are ready to show why gymnastics is an up and coming sport. Majeka Gorzelnik tells us more. The 2013 Ontario Gymnastics Championships are coming to Windsor. Rose City Gymnastics will be hosting over 1,200 athletes, 200 coaches, and 60 judges from across the province for the four day event. The bidding process is similar to that of the Olympics. Recreational Program Director of Rose City and Co-Meet Director of the Championships, Sabrina Slama, says Windsor has a good reputation with hosting these kinds of events. Um, most of these kids are pretty high-end, so it's kind of a once-in-a-lifetime for a lot of kids in Windsor to see. And we host it, we've hosted it two years before, um, but we're trying to get the word out even more because it's an up-and-coming sport, so we want to have people come and watch the, watch the championships. Assistant women's head coach Debbie Mumry says the key is to get athletes to peak in performance just before the championships. Not too early, but soon enough to qualify. Our athletes are working really hard. We have three pre-nationals competing and three in national categories, which has been a long time um, for somebody from Windsor to participate in, so hopefully they do well with their uh, debut into that provincially. Rose City Gymnastics is the oldest, largest, and only not-for-profit gymnastics club in Windsor. Maria Valente and Natalie Coughlin have both been training at the club from a very young age and will both be competing at the Provincials. There's been times where I've almost quit, but yeah, I'm still here. Same. <laughs> it's just like part of our life, kind of. I can't just quit. 
The 2013 Ontario Gymnastics Championships will be held April 4th through 7th at the St. Dennis Centre. For more information, contact Rose City Gymnastics at rec at rosecitygymnastics.com. For Mediaplex News Now, I'm Majeka Gorzelnik. In this edition of Sports Talk, Kenton Wolf talks with first-time panelist Madison Dugan about the end of the Spitfire season. How are you sports fans? I'm Kenton Wolf, and welcome to another edition of Sports Talk. I'm joined today by first-time panelist Madison Dugan. Uh, we're going to talk about Spitfires today. Obviously it was a disappointing season. Uh, they missed the playoffs for the first time since 2007. What exactly do you think went wrong? Um, we had a lot of younger guys this season, and I don't think their drive was there to get to the playoffs. I mean, it was a lot of older guys who wanted it, but and it was their last season, but just couldn't get there. Yeah, they, they ran into a lot of injury trouble and suspension trouble. I know uh, Ryan Verbeek and, and Pat Sanvito both ran into suspension trouble. Uh, Pat Sanvito was suspended on uh, two different occasions, but maybe what could have changed uh, some of their, their discipline was would be a captain. Obviously, they lost captains very opposed at the trade deadline. Uh, what player do you see stepping up as the captain next season? For me, I see player Pat Seeloff stepping up. He was part of the World Juniors. He won gold medal. I think a lot of guys look up to him for that. So I think that he would make a good captain for next season. Yeah, other guys to look to maybe to, to grab the C are, are Brady Vale or, or Kirby Reichel. Both guys were born in 1994, who seem to be with the core of this team. But uh, maybe this isn't the core that they need, considering how poorly they did this season. Uh, they, they have some good 96 players in, in San Vito and, and Joshua Hosang. Uh, what sort of personnel uh, changes do you see coming this summer? Um, Warren Reichel definitely knows how to put together a good team that wants to win. I think that the drive wasn't there for some of the younger players as much as they were for the older players who was their last season. So I think that bringing in more older players, because our team is so young, that the young players will look up to the older players and figure out that that's what they want. That may be the only route they can take, Madison, considering they don't have a, a pick in the first two rounds of the OHL priority selection draft. But they do have two picks in the first round of the uh, import draft from Europe. It'll be interesting to see what they do with that. Well, that's it. That's all for your Mediaplex Sports Talk. I'm Kenson Wolf, And I'm Madison Dugan. Feeling under the weather? Majeka Gorzelnik talks about the benefits of the onion and gives us a tasty recipe for some cough syrup. Runny, stuffed up nose, sore throat, cough, body aches, these are all signs that you may have the common cold. With temperatures swinging back and forth, it's easy to catch. But before you head out the door to a clinic filled with other germs and bacteria that may cause you to get even sicker, why not give some home remedies a try? Garlic and onions are well known for strengthening the immune system, as well as being great natural antibiotics and anti-inflammatories. Adding diced garlic to your regular diet will increase your immunity. Not crazy about garlic? Onion syrup is easy to make and a favorite among grandmothers worldwide. Slice up an onion and put it in a jar, top off with about half a cup of sugar. Seal the jar and let stand for six to eight hours as the onion releases juices. Take one to two teaspoons every few hours to relieve cough and sore throat. Throw in some solid bed rest into the mix and you'll be feeling better in no time. I've been feeling under the weather lately, so I'm going to take some of this and take a nap. I'm Majeka Gorzelnik and this has been your Health Minute. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Rob Benyon and you've been watching Mediaplex News Now. Mediaplex News Now is a production of the St. Clair College Journalism Program.